I can't believe it, it's finally here. I'm Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust, and I am so happy to finally be officially beginning our Western Swing, which seems weird because we're in North Carolina and we're gonna be in Southern Virginia, but somehow I think some of you know that is the West according to some. This is the Western Swing that you, the members of the organization, um, helped us to fund. Um, and we are going to shoot as many videos as possible. I predict no fewer than 35, no more than 50 on this Western swing and we will be all over the place we are going to be in no particular order at all we'll be at uh, Fort Fisher at Wilmington we're going to be at Alamance from the regulator war we're gonna be at the crater at Petersburg we might be at Wise Fork we're gonna go to Bennett place we're gonna go to Bentonville Avrasboro I'll bet you we're gonna try to go to battery 5 in Petersburg five forks the breakthrough Lewis farm and at least a dozen other places as we bring you as many videos as possible um, to kind of show some love to the places we often don't get to go the ones further from our base so first of all thank you so much for supporting us in this now one thing we like you we appreciate what you've done but I am not announcing when we're gonna be where because we don't want you to join us we like you but we want to shoot as many as possible then every single person we run into results in fewer video minutes fewer videos overall so don't try to find us if you do we'll probably put a cape on or something like that and hide from you in any case we are also standing at a historic spot that's relevant to some of the things that we're going to talk about we're going to bring them to you as much as possible in order if we can and for that let me bring on my colleague chris white senior education manager american battlefield trust our vast crew of two out here today uh thanks everybody for joining us today and we're uh talking about some revolutionary war action um, we are talking about what's called the race to the Dan River. So what is the race to the Dan River? Where is the Dan River and why do I care about this? Well, the race to the Dan River actually starts uh, in South Carolina. Uh, during the Battle of Calpens in January of 1781, Daniel Morgan wins a victory against Bannister Tarleton. Uh, Bloody Tarleton as he no he's known during the war. Uh, and this victory is going to be a catalyst to draw the, the British forces up and out of South Carolina into North Carolina in pursuit of two separate wings of the Continental Army. Those will be under the command, direct command, of Nathaniel Green and Daniel Morgan. So what are, where are they going to go? Why is Green coming this way? What he wants to do is Nathaniel Green, 38 years old at this time, uh, Rhode Island native, starts to move up out of South Carolina into North Carolina. He wants to get a waterway between him and the British Army of about 2,500 men under the command of Charles Cornwallis, uh, Charles the Earl Cornwallis, 42 years old. Cornwallis has been uh, a is a veteran commander, as is Nathaniel Green. Cornwallis, though, uh, is has been victorious time and time again throughout his career. Uh, he has served during the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian Wars, it's known in the European theater. He serves at the Battle of Brooklyn. He serves at Charleston during the uh, largest surrender of American forces during the Revolutionary War, then pushes into the backcountry of South Carolina, wins the Battle of Camden. Everything seems to be going well for Cornwallis. He is able to seemingly move through South Carolina, but once, uh, once in time and time again, the Americans keep rising up to come against these British and it becomes pesky work trying to run off all of these Patriot forces. So Cornwallis decides he is gonna to try to land a killing blow, hopefully for the final time, on Daniel Morgan's small force and Nathaniel's green forces, which are split and moving towards Salisbury, North Carolina. The idea that Nathaniel Green has is, let's put a substantial body of water between my army and Cornwallis. Now, Cornwallis also wants to try to cut off supplies coming down from Virginia, North Carolina into the deeper south. He also wants to recapture approximately 600 to 700 prisoners captured at the Battle of, of Calpins. He wants to try to get those men back into his army. And above all, he wants to destroy the American force under Green and under Morgan. So what, what uh, Green is going to do, he doesn't want to go all the way back to Virginia yet, where the Dan River sits. This isn't the race to the Dan yet. This is going to be the race to the Catawba River. He's going to try to fall back, Green is, using the Catawba first. 
and then he's going to engage because Cornwallis keeps coming at a place called the Yadkin River. That doesn't work. So we got to keep going back to the Haw River and then eventually into Virginia. And it turns into what we've dubbed us historians as this race to the Dan. So Daniel Morgan, Nathaniel Green, they start moving their way up into North Carolina. Cornwallis is in hot pursuit. He's going to come up to a place called Ramser's Mill. He decides he's going to be a, the aggressor here. He knows that Morgan and Green are out in front of him. He knows if he can catch up with them quickly, he can potentially destroy the American army in two separate pieces. There's only about 1,400 men that he has to take on with his 2,500 British. So he decides to burn all of his baggage, all of his wagons, and basically try to live off the land as he moves up into North Carolina. On January 28th, he sets off from Ramser's Mill. He pushes to a place called Cowan's Ford and Beatty's Ford on the Catawba River. He's gonna faint towards Beatty's Ford and cross at Cowan's Ford. As he does so, Daniel Morgan knew that this was probably gonna happen. He has a force at Cowan's Ford that is gonna try to stop the British. This is under a guy named William Davidson, Patriot General, who's killed in action there. The British forces, as they start marching towards Cowan's Ford, as they start to go into this icy river, don't fire back. They are gonna stoically march into the river, eventually get to the other side, pushing back those American forces, and then finally fire upon them. And that's when Davis is, Davidson is killed. So Green knows the bag's up here. So he decides he's gonna evacuate. He's gonna evacuate Salisbury. He starts to burn his baggage there that he has, take whatever he can away. He finds all these muskets that are rusted. The militiamen haven't taken care of these muskets. He's upset. He's gonna write to anybody who listens about just how terrible the militiamen who serve under him are. Um, they're really not as bad as he makes them out to be. But then he's going to fall back to that Yadkin River, and who's in pursuit? Cornwallis still. Finally, on February 9th, around February 9th, Green is going to arrive at a place called Guilford Courthouse. If you're familiar with what happens in the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse took place in March. Why is he here in February? What am I talking about? Well, Green actually arrives at Guilford Courthouse in February. He meets with his commanders at a Council of War and says, we have about 1,400 men. Our supplies, they're not in a great position, and we're outnumbered by the British. What should we do? And the guys he meets with say, we should keep falling back. Let's fall back towards Virginia. This will start what we call the Race to the Dan River, which is in south, uh, uh, southern Virginia. And what Green is going to do is split his army into two columns again. He'll have what's called a flying column with his light troops and his troopers, uh, his dragoons, under, uh, under uh, Henry Lee. They're going to try to draw Cornwallis in one way, while Green, with the main army, as well as his artillery and his baggage wagons, go in an opposite direction. He wants to bait Cornwallis and, and go off in an opposite direction, and it works. Cornwallis is going to be marching through North Carolina. He's first going to take that faint, go in the wrong direction, and then finally figure out that these Americans are heading across the Dan River. By February 14th, most of Green's army has crossed the Dan River into Virginia and are now safely on the other side because they've stolen every boat that they can find so that, they, so that the British can't cross that swollen river. Nathaniel Green, it was mentioned by one of the staff officers that they thought he was from this area. He's a Rhode Island native. He's never seen this topography, but he had such a great eye for topography down here. He knew where the fords were. He knew how to work this topography. And even Bannister Tarleton gave a, a grudging compliment to the Americans saying that they executed this perfectly, this, this maneuver falling back. Now, as he's falling back, Green's army is gonna get stronger. Cornwallis's army is gonna get weaker. Why? Because this is an outpost war. His projection of power for the British started at the sea at Charleston, South Carolina. Then they had to move into the back country every position that they start to take they have to leave some soldiers here soldiers there and as he moved up into north carolina he was in the wake of an enemy army who is bringing in all the supplies that they can so by late february cornwallis's small army is now in dire straits they're running out of food they are running out of fodder for their horses they are even toting along about a hundred uh, or so American prisoners from a few different engagements along the way at the Dan River, places like Torrance's Tavern uh, or, and Cowan's Ford and other places. So Cornwallis is getting weaker and Green is getting stronger. He's written to Thomas Jefferson, who's the governor of Virginia. He said, I need men, I need materiel. He's written to Patrick Henry and that's what they're doing. They're sending militia down. He's written to 
Abner Rush, the governor of North Carolina, who's now sending militiamen into North Carolina uh, to help bol or up into Virginia to help bolster. There's South Carolinians and Georgians there too. Some Pennsylvanians are even mixed in. So he has a growing army, which will eventually grow to about 4,500 men. And on February 19th, he's going to send a light column. These are lightly uh, uh, burdened troops and troopers, horsemen, to come back down into North Carolina. He told the North Carolinians, I'm not abandoning you. Green's really good in retreat. He's learned well. George Washington retreated a lot during his early days in 1776 and into 77, and Green was part of that army. He's learned from George Washington how to retreat. Now he learns to be aggressive also from George Washington, who when he could be the aggressor, tried to be. So Green will send a force down into this area where we're standing. And that'll be a force under uh, Henry Lee. He's known as Light Horse Harry Lee today during the time of the war. He wasn't called Light Horse Harry. Uh, he was, uh, you know, Colonel Lee of the Light Horse. Uh, so we don't have any contemporary records calling him Light Horse Harry Lee. Nonetheless, Harry, Harry Lee has a grudge. Near Summersville, North Carolina, modern day Summersville, North Carolina, about five miles north of Greensboro, he lost a, a young soldier named James Gillies. Uh, and he felt that Gillies, who was a, a bugler and who was unarmed in a small skirmish with Bannister Tarleton's cavalry, uh, was shot in cold blood. He felt that he shouldn't, shouldn't have been shot, he shouldn't have been killed, and he's so enraged that Lee is going to tell an officer, a captured British officer, to write out his last lines, and he's gonna go hang him out in a field, in a tree that he has nearby. Some people try to talk him out of it. Lee's not having any of it. But in the nick of time, down the road came some of Tarleton's men and drove off Lee, leaving that probably shaken British officer uh, sitting there questioning this war. So now Lee arrives in the area where we are. We're near Mebane, uh, also near Burlington, North Carolina. He's going to arrive in an area uh, that is near the Alamance Battleground. The Alamance Battleground is a 1771 Regulator War battle. And there's a veteran of that battle near here, and his name is uh, John Pyle. Pyle is a colonel of Loyalist troops. He is an American who is putting his, his uh, money where his mouth is for King George and country. So Pyle is gonna to put together a group of anywhere between 200 and 400 horsemen. The numbers vary greatly. And Pyle tells General Cornwallis that, hey, I have these men, I'm willing to bring them to you, but I need some, I need some protection to get from where we are over to Hillsborough, about 15 miles away. So Cornwallis says, I'll send Bannister Tarleton, I'll send some other troops out there, we'll bring you in, you can come support the, support our cause. In the meantime, Andrew Pickens and Henry Lee arrive out in this area. Henry Lee's troopers are dressed identical in green frocks, plumes, everything that look exactly like Bannister Tarleton's men. And riding up onto these Loyalist troops comes Henry Lee, and there's a few different stories, and there's a few different angles, so, you know, you can read whatever you want. But Lee rides up and down the line, according to one account, realizes they're Loyalist troops, and doesn't say anything at first, and then orders his men to attack. That's one, one take on it. Another take is that Lee rides up to John Pyle, who is the colonel of these men, these Loyalists. He starts to talk to him. Some people think that Lee knew that these were Loyalists. Others don't. But down the line, one of his officers is going to ask, who do you fight for? And one of the men will say his majesty or King George or something of that sort and immediately draw his saber and start hacking at the man. This turns into what is called Pyle's defeat, Pyle's massacre, or Pyle's hacking match. In a few moments, Andrew Pickens' men, as well as Light Horse Harry Lee's men, will fall upon these loyalists unsuspectingly and start basically, as some of them say, massacring these men. Now, some of these loyalist troops are gonna say, stop, stop, we're on your side. They think that these are Tarleton's men. They think that, hey, you've mistaken us for American forces, you're the, for Patriot forces, but that's not the case. And after just a few minutes, at least 93 men are killed from Pyle's side, as well as something in the neighborhood about 250 are either captured or run off. John Pyle himself, a doctor, 
who served in the regulator war, the war of regulation here in North Carolina, he will be captured and he will actually tend to both American and loyalist troops after the war, or I'm sorry, after the battle. So why would Lee do something like this? Is this one isolated incident, incident with a, a lone trooper named James Gillies? Perhaps. Perhaps it also goes back to what's called the Battle of the Waxhaws or Buford's Massacre. This is a, a May 1780 battle that took place near Charleston, South Carolina when Bannister Tarleton arrives and comes upon a, a group of Continental soldiers led by uh, Abram Buford. And Allegedly, the American soldiers had put down their arms and Tarleton is going to order his men to massacre these Continental soldiers. Now, there are some, some stories that come out about uh, what may or may not have happened. Uh, Buford's men allegedly waited till Tarleton's men got within about 50 yards before they fired at these troopers coming down upon them. Tarleton's in charge of a legion of, of light infantry as well as light cavalry. And then some say that after laying down their arms, a few of the Americans picked up their arms and tried to shoot after they had surrendered shoot some of these British men. Either way, it turns into what is called, you know, Tarleton's Quarter, known amongst the American army, that there is no quarter. That means you will be killed. Uh, some, men, some will start calling him Bloody Tarleton. Today we call him Bloody Ban. That didn't come about until the 1950s, actually. Uh, but we would have called him Bloody Tarleton in the 1700s. So the question is, you know, was Pyle's defeat a massacre? Was Buford's defeat or Buford's massacre actually a massacre? Or was the or were these British soldiers actually fired upon by these Americans? There's a John Moss has brought up that he has found evidence. Uh, at a, a settlement nearby, a, actually a North Carolina settlement, who was taking care of some of the some of the wounded soldiers during the war, talking about Buford's massacres. A Continental soldier said, "Yeah, one of our soldiers picked up a gun and shot at these British." So it possibly could have happened. So the war here in North Carolina and in South Carolina is very much a civil war within a civil war, and that civil war started well before the American Revolution. The Wars of Regulation set neighbor versus neighbor against one another, over taxation, uh, corruption on a local level. And it becomes very personal during the American Revolution up here. Houses are burned, towns are burned. Uh, it will be a very personal war. So the atrocities that will take place will take place, unfortunately, on both sides. But Pyle's defeat, we have a monument up behind us, Gary's pointing to, uh, that was placed here in 1996 that marks the general location of where this action took place on February 25th of 1781, one of the preludes to the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, which took place about 25 miles from where we're standing over near modern day Greensboro, North Carolina. So if you ever get a chance to come down to Guilford, you can ride out towards Burlington and Mebane, and you can visit Pyle's Massacre. And this is just one of the first sites that we're gonna to go to here uh, during our big video swing in the West, here in Southern Virginia and into North Carolina. Gary, anything to add? Um, no, thank you, Chris. We're looking forward to uh, engaging with you on Facebook and YouTube. All right, thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing this video because I know you're about to share it with all your friends and family. Thank you for going to battlefields.org and becoming a member of the American Battlefield Trust. And thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation.